for today. And uh, we just want to, you know, link this with, uh, you know, why this topic is important because MAPS, uh, this year's virtual conference, main theme is value-driven learning culture. And as I said at the very beginning of the, of the uh, conversation, some of you are here, so I had a bit of conversation to do a sound check. And I said that, you know, if the people in the organization are not well and healthy, they are not mentally and physically fit, regardless of the training that you do and the culture that you try to bring and build, it's not going to help you to get anywhere. So with this, I'm going to introduce you our panelists that we have today. Uh, we have three wonderful ladies joining with us this evening. And I'm going to introduce and each uh, panelist can say a few words of open remarks. That would be lovely. So I would like to start with uh, uh, Alicia. So we have, have Alicia. I'm sure not, uh, you know, many of you already know her. She, uh, you know, she's been to some of our events uh, as, as a speaker. Um, and and uh, you know, we had the pleasure of hosting events with her. Uh, she's currently the co-founder and counselor uh, of Institute for Wellness Education. She's an advocate for um, a good rights at workplace, good workplace practices, wellness, both mental and physical. And uh, you know, she's a fan of making sure that the people are looked after, regardless of the organization, the size of the organization, or whatever the business that you are in. And I know many organizations have the opportunity to have her as a speaker on the topic of wellness. Now, you know, this panel discussion is very special because we have a speaker joining us all the way from Trinidad and Tobago. But before I do that, Lish, would you like to say a few opening remarks? Uh, thank you, Afif, and thank you for the lovely introduction. It's an honor to be part of this conference, and especially with international speakers. Uh, creating a culture of uh, happiness and wellness is very important to any organization because we know that as employees, uh, we can't be happy at work if we are not happy at home. And if we are not happy at home, we can't be happy at work. So it goes vice versa. So we need to make sure that our employees are well taken care of, uh, both with the happiness and wellness. So I hope through this session, you will be gaining some insight from the speakers on the topic. Yes, wonderful. Very, very good. Yes, I, I also see that we have actually participants joining from the U.S. to watch this live. But well, some of them are in our Zoom room and also uh, Toronto and Tobago. I guess those are the supporters of Dr. Safia. So let me give an introduction of her since she is not from the modest, but I'm sure from now on you probably will connect with her on Facebook and LinkedIn. Dr. Safia is from Trinidad and Tobago, a Caribbean island. Um, and she, um, you know, she's the founder and the chief executive officer of SISU Global Wellness, an institution and organization that focuses on the wellness of the workplace, both domestically and globally. A global speaker led team presentation at the United Nations for the Commission of the Status of Women, and also led a number of national health initiatives and honored by her fraternity, University of the West Indies, as one of the 50 distinguished alumni at their 50th anniversary. She's also a John Maxwell leadership coach, and shares the highlight of her career is winning the personal physician to Malala Nobel Peace Prize winner on her visit to Trinidad and Tobago. This is Global Awareness focuses on transformational behavior strategies to combat NCDs, stress, burnout, and employee engagement, uh, and, and disengagement at, at workplace. And she's a, a specialist in terms of this. Um, Dr. Safia, we are pleased to have you joining with these two wonderful ladies from the Maldives. And uh, would you like to say a few opening remarks, please? Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us in the third session. Thank you to the Maldives Association, Asif, and all the hard work for putting together this very important panel. Too often, wellness, well being, which is the pertinent building block of any organization, because our human economy is the most important. Too often, our well being is always put at last. But with this new COVID that brought forward this uh, pandemic world, it has shown us how important wellness and resilience and certain unique human traits are important for organizations to feature on. So thank you for this panel and I look forward to contributing to it. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much. Our next panelist for this evening 
Um, there's also obviously a familiar face in terms of speaking engagements and training and coaching and guidance. Um, Ava Shahina currently the, uh, she's the CEO of um, Career Vitamin International, where she uh, brings, through coaching, she brings the best out of uh, people who need guidance and who need support. And throughout her journey of whether working for a company or having her own business, uh, she was somebody who was who always advocated that regardless of what you have in life and where you are in life, you must always use opportunities that you already have to make the lives of other people better. And that's what she had been doing uh, even during this uh, period of, you know, the situation and the crisis where I just done quite a wonderful job throughout, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the nation in terms of virtual sessions and reaching out to other people to help. And uh, she will be speaking on the topic of gratitude and happiness at work. Shahina, a welcome remark. Thank you Afi, for the wonderful introduction. I'm very grateful actually to have this lovely group of participants and uh, I would like to talk about happiness and gra gratitude, how important it is to be happy, to remain happy. Of course, we are in a pandemic, we are in a difficult situation, but that doesn't mean actually we shouldn't be happy. The, whatever the outside circumstances are, we can be always happy by being grateful. So thank you, look forward to having a wonderful discussion. Yes, very good. Thank you. So um, to start off this, um, you know, the, the session, um, of, uh, I, I believe Lisha is going to um, um, introduce the, uh, men, I mean, uh, the Mentimeter quiz. Uh, so before I put the quiz on, would you like to talk a little bit about that, Lisha, and then I'll try to I'll put that on and then the participants can join after your little introduction of the purpose of the quiz that we're going to show them right now. So we'll be uh, asking you all a couple of questions, which is regard regarding to your overall uh, well-being. So usually as human beings, we regard our wellness or well-being usually linked with finance. So even, with ha even when you're regarding happiness, we usually regard it uh, with the, the financial aspect. So we, when we are doing our discussion, we would like to see how the audience maintain or how does the participants maintain their overall uh, wellness and well-being. So hopefully that we will be able to get some data from the participants and uh, their viewpoint on how they are currently maintaining their wellness and well -being. Yes. So the first question is, uh, how many of you sleep less than six hours per night? Yeah, so for the, for the interest of the participants that probably may have not experienced Mentimeter, you need to go to open the web page, just go to www.menti.com and use the code 931891. I will also write the code on the chat box for everybody's interest. It's 9318891. I'm sure by now everybody probably is very familiar with this. I can see we've got some good responses coming there. So we have quite a few questions coming. At least she's gonna read out the question for you every time when I'm when I when I show it to you. We probably will do like 20 to maybe 30 responses. And then we'll move on to the next one. So keep the answers coming. We're 23 now. We need 30. So out of 84 participants, yeah. And I know many of you are watching this on Facebook. You can still participate even if you're on Facebook. You have to go to www.menti.com and the code is 9318891. And you'll be able to participate. We're 28 now. Okay, 28. Lish, shall we go to the next question? Sure. Good. So the next question is, right there. Okay, so the next question is, how many of you are always available online and always multitasking? Sorry, I just saw the question. No, that's all right, because there's always a bit of delay in receiving it to different devices, but you, yeah, that, that should be fine. I'll, I'll read the question for you. I know you have a lot to speak this evening. So, <laughs> all right, good. It's 43, so we'll go to the next question. So the next question is, you're gonna see this on your slide screen now. How many of you are always the first to right to walk and last to leave? Oh. I think I belong mostly to the category of the blue color, <laughs> I would say. But um, 
Yeah, I guess it all depends, right? I suppose if we manage to go to the gym in between and, you know, do this, do that. All right. So we're 39 responses there. Very good. Oh, my God. I have my colleague here, Maisha, on this call. She's the assist, uh, training queue officer of Lux South. And she just sent me a private message saying, this is definitely you. Like, it's me. Like, she's saying that I'm the one. Last one to arrive to work and last it. Why should I take that as a compliment, by the way? Thank you. So next question here. Um, the next question is, how many of you are juggling work and other priorities? Good. How many of you are juggling work and other priorities? In terms of how hard it is, or how difficult, are you? I mean, are you having difficulty of actually balancing your work and other priorities? Yeah, those who just joined, if you like, for the Mentimeter code is 91, sorry, 931891. So we're going to go to the next question here. We have seven questions like this because our panelists and the speakers are going to actually build their conversations around the responses that you will give today. How many of you do not have time for physical fitness? Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, I mean, 21, this is concerning. We need to work on this. <laughs> 26, all right. Yeah, okay. I, I suppose that's the current status, but there's definitely something we can change. So we should stay optimistic. 48, very good. It's almost 50 responses there. Uh, at least we have some work to do here. They've got 29 people said they don't have time for fitness. So we need some real motivation. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, the next question you will see on the in your slide deck now is how many of you never had time for self-care within the last few weeks? Okay, I, I think it's, it's great to be honest and genuine. I, I think it is what it is today, but we can change it. Right. If we I think take some learning from today's session, we definitely will have a, a great opportunity there to, um, you know, get on with it. So great. I'm going to go to the next question here. So the next question is: How many of you did not have an engaged conversation with someone over the past week? So an engaged conversation could be. But virtually, especially considering the current states we are in in the world, or it could be on the phone, or just hello, hi, or hello, bye. It could be a very valuable conversation that, that, you, that, that, that you had with someone, you know, listening to somebody's problem, listening to someone's view, right? Good. Good, 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 good. All right. So let's see what we get done. Okay. Okay, so we have. Okay, hold on just to see if we have. Uh, all right, I think that's the. Um, just checking if the. Um, there's, there's the. Yes, so that is the last question of our, our panel. Um, you know, uh, the last conversation for the for the panel. Um, so, Leish, um, you know, would, would you want to do a little remark about why we did we, we did the quiz, and then we'll go we'll straight into the uh, into the questions now? Yeah. Yes, of course. So, first and foremost, about the sleep, I think that uh, I'm sure that many of us actually neglect uh, the time that we actually allocate for our rest or the sleep that we need. But we can't have a productive day or we can't have a happy day. We can't have a positive day unless we have the set amount of rest or the sleep. Because often a lot of workers are sleep deprived because our lifestyle is we sleep very late, but we have to wake up to go to work. So, the start of the day is actually not good. So, uh, we end up being moody and not being very uh, productive till the end of the day. And also multitasking, it's usually uh, portrayed as something which is uh, favorable 
but then when we study mindfulness when we study positivity we when we study awareness we know that actually multitasking could be very draining and stressful for a, a, a lot of people so it's actually good to prioritize and declutter and to make sure you go to your most productive self and also the first to work the uh, last to leave is something such as uh, which is called as presenteeism so the time that you need to be at home or the time that you need to be resting or the time that you need to be doing something calming or something happy you are spending it at, at work so it has negative uh, implications once again and also juggling our uh, most of our work life is uh, very hectic so we are always uh, kind of in a battle between our what can we prioritize and when we are at work our mind is at home when we are at home our mind is at work so it's kind of a constant battle so in order to be at your best self you need to have a balance in this as well and also uh, to be a, a perfect person not a perfect but to be well you need a mixture of both our mental and physical fitness so uh, with the priority that we we are giving to our fitness uh, should be a bit more than what we are currently doing even myself as well and also the self care aspect of it uh, we need to maintain ourselves we need to maintain our mental and physical self as well yeah and then of course we humans are social beings so we need that connection we need the relationship so we need to be uh, communicating with others so just to have uh, engaged uh, positive communication or a connection with someone else would actually help to your overall balance Yeah, very good. Thank you. I'm sure during the conversation, our three speakers are gonna, um, you know, highlight on this. So, to all the participants that, that have just joined with us uh, and you know, a bit earlier, please do send your questions because we are going to also ask questions in between, um, you know, to all the uh, to all the panelists here. So, um, obviously, our purpose of this conversation today will be divided into mainly three parts. One will be to really bring the learners. um ideas and concept from a global perspective and then we're going to be looking at the modus con- uh, you know context we're going to be looking then into happiness and gratitude at work so my first question of tonight's uh, discussion goes to dr safia from trinidad and tobago um what is the global perspective and economic impact of uh, unwellness you know people are not well and and you know what would be the real impact in the global um you know perspective and i know that you you have had opportunities to work with the united nations um and several other world leaders uh, on this uh, you know the whole topic of wellness could you if you could enlighten us on that question so thank you so much afif um at essentially and this is a report from global wellness institute out of 2016 here's what interestingly they had to say that three 3.4 billion workers are unwell. When I had the opportunity to present at the United Nations, it was for the Commissioner Status of Women. And we looked specifically at the health of women, but of course we want to extrapolate that to the health or the ill unhealth wellness or the ill health of both men and women. Now this is a 2016 report. Today, 2020, during this unprecedented pandemic of covid-19 where our world was changing at an incomparable pace we now have a rising epidemic of an unwell workforce to the point that harvard school of public health is estimating that chronic disease and unwellness is going to cal- going to cost us something like 2.2 trillion dollars for the next couple of years so exactly what lisha and shahina and some of the speakers above earlier on mentioned about disengagement and all of these different stress well exactly what all of our participants just shared in terms of physical fitness and working consistently it's really we have to make that transformational shift because the cost of unwellness is going to affect not just us individually organizations but companies and countries as a whole yeah very good i think that the, the, the key take there is that if we don't pay attention to the wellness and the health of our people you know it's going to fire back as a one point and i think where we are today you know though it has shown to the world that you know we, we, we companies and even the most largest you know conglomerates they keep on spending a lot on different other aspects except the wellness and health and safety and you know it has fired fired them back at at, at a different way so my next question is to um leesh 
Um, what is the link between a wellness-oriented work environment and employees' productivity and well-being? So how are these both linked? First and foremost, I would like to say that uh, when we hire workers or when employees first start their work, uh, working day, there's a lot of hopes and expectations, both from the employees and employers' uh, perspective. But what we are finding is burnout, stress, turnover, absenteeism. So as an employer, we need to find what is missing or we need to find the gap uh, in order to actually correct it. So wellness plays a huge role in it. So first and foremost, uh, the components in wellness approach we need emotional well-being of workers we need uh, we need the environment to be a safe and a encouraging environment we need to create a uh, space for workers to develop their intellectual abilities we need uh, physical fitness we need social connections and we need to work on employee spiritual connection in terms of uh, developing their values and virtues so how can this impact their productivity is when you're working in a safe working environment when you are working in a compassionate working environment where you are encouraged to voice out your ideas, your development is encouraged, your ideas are acknowledged. So it's kind of a happy, compassionate, inclusive work environment, free of toxicity, free of unfair competition, free of discrimination. You feel acknowledged, you are given the flexibility to do your work. So. Uh, there's a lot of advantages such as increased empowerment. So workers actually work, they are motivated. It creates a, star, a calm state of mind in the organization. So we see a reduction in absenteeism. We, we see a, re, a reduction in presenteeism, uh, labor turnover, and also it attracts a good pool of uh, recruits. So if you are portrayed or if you're known as an organization, who is uh, having these wellness programs it attracts a pool of really good recruits as well. Uh, the workers feel connected, they, they feel like they matter in the whole organization. So instead of just uh, viewing financial success as the success of the organization, viewing thriving employees and uh, passionate employees as success actually helps the overall look and image of the organization and you don't need to spend so much money on motivation or on benefits but workers themselves they will work towards and take the organizations uh, to the next level yes uh, very very good and i think the, the 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 key point there is that you know um how you define the compassionate workplace i think um, in a lot of the organizations, we do have uh, policies and procedures of uh, you know, promoting health, health, healthy workplace or workspace. But having a policy is not going to help us to achieve what we need to achieve. We need to really uh, you know, practice it and making sure that the people really live it that way. Um, and that is, the, that is how you would you know, get into this wellness culture, the wellness creation. Um, and obviously, you know, we're talking about wellness, and I think if people are well and healthy, there's also an indication that, you know, you will see that organization is a bit happier or the employees feel a bit grateful. So I would like to go to Shahina on this question. What's the difference between happiness and well-being? And what can we do to cultivate happiness in individuals? So the, the real point here is to get in this out from people, I mean, you practice the wellness thing, but how do you show that the people are really happy at work? So if you could enlighten us in this question. Thank you, Afif. Uh, that's a wonderful question because uh, Safiya and Alicia was talking about unwellness and uh, wellness culture in the office. But before we go into the uh, environment of a wellness or well-being culture, let us understand what happiness and well-being is. Actually, on an individual level, happiness is feeling or showing pleasure or contentment. When we want to understand well-being, we have to. I have to actually take you a little bit deep into psychology. That's. The, I would go for a reference from Jordan B. Peterson, professor of University of Toronto. He has explained positive psychology as a scientific approach to study human thoughts, feelings, and behavior, with focus on strengths instead of weakness, building good in life instead of repairing the bed, taking lives of, lives of average people to great, instead of focusing solely on moving those who are struggling up to the normal. 
so when we take on this positive psychology aspect actually well being is happiness there is two components of um, uh, positive psychology that is called the subjective well being we call it hedonic which means mainly referring to the presence of positive mood absence of negative mood satisfaction in various domains of life and then there is the eudaimonic which is the psychological well being which means the sense of control feeling of mean, meaningful purpose feeling of the belongingness so this is what we call well well being in a workplace and i have to say that happiness is fleeting and changeable state but not a personality trait so everybody can change their state and be, try to be happy so happiness is based on reaching one's own potential and operating at full function so let us look at some ways i would um, go explain five ways where we can cultivate happiness once we learn how to cultivate happiness on our own then we have to go and engage with other people so that we can actually understand so the first point is to train your brain to be more positive actually as human on an average 60000 thoughts cross our mind per day so these thoughts are based on our past experiences if we are actually have had a terrible life in earlier days in our life or always these memories these thoughts of what happened what might happen in respect to these incidents which ha- which had happened in our life actually these were, would be disturbing us if this is disturbing us how can we be peaceful how can we be happy so the idea is actually whenever we have a negative thought we have to actually embrace it if we have to fight against it uh, we are not going to succeed but we would go into depression and anxiety so, so rather than fighting against it we have to embrace it we have whenever there is this thought we have to cancel it out let's say i can i might get a thought seen me going into an accident so immediately okay i can say no that won't happen it never happened so it won't happen so i can immediately cross it out then the other thing we can do to train our brain is to be grateful on my next question i would explain about gratitude so i won't go detail into it the second one is actually nurture and enjoy relationships as human beings we are actually born to live with other people so we have to actually live with other people and be happy learn how to be happy so take conscious effort to stay connected invest quality time with the important people the third point to be happy is live in the moment and savor life's pleasure so what if we focus your let's look at depression what happens with depression depression means we are actually thinking about a past incident in our life because of this incident we can't get ourselves out of this thing and then we will be wondering okay what will happen this happened to me yesterday this happened to me this year so how can i move forward this will be always my life so to actually live in the moment the best thing we can do is just take a breath we can until our tummy is full we can take a breath in inhale a breath and then slowly let it out exhale so repeat this one five times once we are done with the breathing five times actually we have controlled our nervous system when we are able to control our nervous system forget about the past forget about the future but think about now okay this is me what can i do at the moment what are the things that i could do this moment to make change my life to a, the better person and the fourth point is focus on helping others again it links to the nurture and enjoy in relationship so when we are born to help and to be with other people how can we live with meaning so we can volunteer and practice kindness utilize our strength to help the greater good the fifth point actually it's very related to what leesh has done and the mentimeter questions take better care of your health in terms of physical health and mental health mental health opens relates to meditation and gratitude physical health is actually going into the and developing our muscles 
so what i would say is when we want to be happy we have to take small steps to make a big difference over that start now with small steps and you can be happy i can guarantee that wow very good very good so that is a that's a great you know the point then you know just want to my key takeaway there i'm sure our participants are taking quite a lot of good great stuff from here my key takeaway is that i think if you want to be happy helping others actually does make uh you know yourself happy you know i i i mean many of you know i i work at lux resorts and i'm in lux authority right now there are days where i may get an email from somebody which when i read the email i get disappointed i won't respond it most of the time i would take my bicycle go around the resort i would say hello hi to people and every time i say hello hi it actually give you know brings positivity to me when i come back and sit in my office and i respond to the email most of the time i have responded it well <laughs> so i think i i thought i want to share this story with you and uh, i'm knowing i'm using the technique so uh, everything is great um so all the participants are you you know let's go to the chat box how, are you are you enjoying our conversation here are you learning how how do you feel right now be with us on this you know go ahead and write down comments there are you enjoying our conversation with our three wonderful speakers here yes give us a yes to the chat box so that we can keep going good all right thank you so my next question is obviously want to bring a little bit of a global perspective here uh so to dr safia how can organizational wellness platforms be integrated into a chart training development plans because i think at times the the organizations they do have this wellness thing but it's related to people but if it's not connected to the human capital a chart department it was not going to work so please talk about this point for us so exactly exactly what you shared there fi and i just want to applaud that story that you shared about the not responding right away and jumping on your bike what you did there is a perfect strategy what we call taking a mindful moment and as shahina that's one of the ways and alicia shared mindfulness is key in terms of implementing it within the companies and that mindful moment that pause in between where a stressful a stressful action comes on to you you take that pause and you have a response rather than a reaction and for those who practice mindfulness would understand what that pause does to our bodies to our systems so how can organizations really integrate wellness platforms within their company it has to be from a top down approach it has to start from your c suite it has to start from your organizational managers and then trickle down to the employees and when i say start those healthy habits exactly as you shared integrating physical fitness integrating mindfulness practices integrating compassionate conversations we need to move the workplace from a culture of illness to a culture of wellness and i want all of our participants to write down this word illness on a sheet of paper scratch you know, i think it's a, you know the key point here is that understanding organizations to really i mean you know we do a lot of things in the organization in terms of various activities just to you know make people you know uh you know healthy and wealthy um but sometimes what happens there's no integration in there so we need to bring a holistic approach and i think that's where the result lies into it right so um you know the you, you have a very, you, you know we have a really good point over there and i'm going to move into leash now just to get into the uh, from again from a uh, you know local context um what are the policies adopted by local companies to create a culture of happiness and wellness what's your take on that locally speaking it's a, a bit new concept in motives but we can see that in results uh, it's a bit uh, they've adopted it uh, in their daily life but when we when i spoke to uh, some of the main corporations in this country we can see that there there, there has been focus on the physical fitness so are uh, having organization uh, in house gym facilities or uh, fitness classes having insurance covers so in terms of you getting unwell so not a preventive matter but 
uh, having insurance cover for you and your family, uh, training facilities, so developing our workers' intellectual well-being, because when we, store, when we talk about wellness and well-being, we need to know the difference. So wellness means uh, you are well, you don't have a disease, you are well both physically and mentally. But when we talk about well-being, it means the overall. So it uh, financial, spiritual, uh, emotional, physical. So when we talk about overall well-being, still organizations have a long way to go. But there are financial uh, interest-free uh, financial schemes. There are financial aids with your family member or if you are in any sort of emergency or dangerous situations. Uh, in terms of social connections, there are clubs, there are uh, recreational activities done in organizations. And also... Um, there are like, uh, for example, there are acknowledgement of workers. So if you are in a top 10 of employee of the year, you get trips to go with your family. So those sort of uh, mechanisms have been done. But uh, when we talk about a good direction, we can see that a lot of organizations are now coming up with a mental health schemes and emotional uh, well-being or emotional intelligence schemes. So even as IV, as Institute for Wellness Education, there are organizations actually uh, contacting us to develop mental health training programs, to develop our psychosocial support teams in their organizations. Uh, so mainly uh, when we talk about a local context, context, we can see that Many organizations are now adopting zero tolerance to uh, harassment, uh, discrimination. They are having employee engagement programs, family engagement programs. But when it comes to wellness program, it's we are still a little bit behind. But when I spoke to some of the resorts, we can see that uh, they have healthy eating uh, patterns. So uh, for all the meals are provided by the resorts and they make sure that the healthy option is always there. There are physical activities in the resorts. There are Zumba weekly, Zumba classes, morning meditation, morning yoga classes. Uh, there are discounted packages for families, uh, workers' families to come and have a holiday. So it builds the connection or the uh, uh, just the connection between the family and reduces the work-life balance issues as well and also training so a lot of resorts that they bring in expertise from all over the world even from Mali city and they develop training programs for employees of future growth and also in some of the resorts they have a rest and relax packages for the employees so the a certain fund is given for the employees per year annually so they could actually spend that money any way they like in order to get that uh, vacation or the relaxation that they need. So our companies are slowly moving towards wellness because we all know that uh, an employee will provide the best service if they're in their best state of mind and also body. Yeah, very good. And I think you, you highlighted a very good point there because we have to implement things that will work well, you know, regard, you know, regardless of the other. For some, it could be even, you know, encouraging or offering a package where the employees based in a particular city or, you know, an island that can use the wellness facilities of by someone else. If you're in a resort, I think there's great opportunities available there. And I know that we had that conversation and I was mentioning that um, post-pandemic, all the human resource departments, they should have a wellness officer. But you don't need to hire an additional person. You can just give the responsibility of that to somebody else in the, you know, someone, maybe it could be the HR coordinator, the HR officer, and say, you are the learner's officer. You have to run all these activities. And this is, you know, going to be your, the new responsibilities. And I'm sure that, you know, people, you know, the, the colleagues will take it on there. Now, I have a question to participants, right? So the question is that among you know, we have right now 59, 60 participants here. How many of you regularly goes to gym or participates in gym activities on a regular basis? If you are somebody who goes to the gym or who goes to run, say yes or me. Okay, good, good, good. Keep that coming. Yeah, I know we have a few, uh, few participants that are just joined. Yeah. Good, 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 good. All right, so there's, there's quite a lot of participants that actually sometimes, no, okay, fine, good. So 
Now I'm going to move. Uh, so uh, as I said at the very beginning of our conversation, please do send your questions through the chat box so we can ask from the participants. Feel free to ask any questions that you have regarding. We're talking about wellness. We're talking about gratitude and happiness at workplace. And we're talking about how can we create a holistic approach in terms of wellness and workplace. So my next question is to uh, Shahina. And it's why is gratitude such an important factor in creating happy employees? How can we practice gratitude and how can we incorporate gratitude in workplace? Well, thank you, Afif. Again, a uh, very good question because uh, gratitude is actually uh, what makes our life more happy. So I would describe gratitude as the closest sibling of appreciation. Appreciation is acknowledging the goodness in life, but gratitude goes a step further. It re recognizes how the positive things in our life, like success at work, often comes due to forces outside ourselves, so particularly the effort, effort of other people. So we are successful because other people are helping us, other people are contributing to our work. But this is mostly where the problem arise. We often believe our success is due to work. So in order to succeed, to be the next person, to be the best version of yourself, you should say thank you to the next person who is helping. A just a simple thank you, it goes a long way in reducing stress. It leads to better work environment. Employees who feel appreciated are more likely to have higher job satisfaction. People feel that they are more deeply connected to the organization. And the most important and the best thing is gratitude costs you nothing. Mm -hmm. So let's go a little bit into further detail of what gratitude is, how we can incorporate that one in our, into our culture. You, when we look at organizations, there's Ryan Fair, assistant professor of University of Washington. He has said, we tend to think of organizations as transactional places where we are supposed to be professional. We may think that it is unprofessional to bring things like forgiveness, gratitude, or compassion into workplace. So that's where we have to change. We can forgive, we can forget, we can be grateful, we can say thank you, and then we can still try to work together. So evidence suggests that gratitude and appreciation contribute to the kind of workplace environment whose, where employees actually want to come to work and don't feel like cognitions. So uh, Forbes, actually Forbes mentioned, uh, named Southeast Asia, Southwest as the number 13 best employer of 2018. Why? They have actually highlighted the main point as gratitude and appreciation was cornerstone of Southwest culture. So what were they doing actually to make a difference? The difference was one way they did it was appreciation of employee by paying atten attention to small, simple attentions of their personal life. Let's say if I am employed, if my daughter is graduating, they will send their wishes. They will send a gift to my daughter. So I feel very good and motivated to come back into this environment and be with this company. So uh, gratitude, actually, to practice grat gratitude on a personal level, we can just do a simple exercise. Take a piece of paper every day when you wake up in the morning, first thing in the morning, take a piece of paper and write what are the things you are grat grat grateful for. For example, the ability to breathe, the ability you got another day to live, the ability that you have food on your table, the ability that your children are happy and moving around in the house. You can see them. So these are the simplest things. Actually, we usually don't think about the air we breathe. But the moment we are in the ICU, we will feel, okay, how important that air is. So without delay, just try to write those things every day in the morning. Actually, I have a personal story I can share with you. In 2018, I was a very, actually, depressed person. So what happened was because of several things that was happening in my personal life, I was always seeing the negative. So one day I actually came across a webinar from Brian Tracy where he said, 
take a piece of paper and write 10 things you are grateful for so every day what i did was i took my diary in the morning and i started writing 10 things the same things repeated some days some days i had other things so within 3 months actually it changed my whole life i, I never felt that okay i'm going through this situation at home but in my, my person on a personal level i feel happy i feel content i feel the urge to go out there and tell somebody that i am very grateful i am very happy there are several of these things in my life but i am a happy person i started smiling i started actually interacting with other people on a positive note so gratitude is, is a very wonderful uh, tool that you can practice when you want to be happy to live the fulfilled life now we can say gratitude is the gateway drug to empathy being grateful means you recognize the intentions and the effort behind the actions of another person so you are empathetic you are actually great practices put in bringing you together now to cultivate gratitude in organizations i would suggest uh, five things again four things four items the first thing is gratitude it, gratitude is about whole person it is not about a certain task usually in organizations we have this recognition and re we recognize the reward and performance of achievement but rather instead of that recognizing the performance or the achievement let's try to appreciate the person the effort that person is bringing so the difference between celebrating record breaking sales versus applauding a caring and helpful spirit there's a difference instead of the record breaking sales celebrate that person for his effort Actually, last year i got the opportunity to attend the 20th anniversary of a large company in maldives from the event what i noticed was they were actually distributing awards to the employees who did a remarkable contribution and most of the awards were taken by the uh, lower level staff those foreign expatriates who were the back office or support staff so i asked the managing director what was the reason these staff a lot of these lower level staff are getting recognition and award on on stage he said actually the sales person made a huge sale but that person couldn't have done the sale without the support system these people so they were appreciating the company has this culture to appreciate the effort of this back office staff the effort of these people so the second point i would like to go is gratitude isn't one size fits all so what i feel happy or what i want in my life might not be what afif wants in his life so if you appreciate the same way as you appreciate me for afif it might not work for him because it would be something different for him and the third thing is great great gratitude must be embraced by leaders when we say it should be embraced by leaders we are working in a very busy environment if the leaders see that we are taking every day the first 10 minute of our office time to write our gratitude journal and the leaders are not following this what will happen they will say okay he is not productive he is not doing the right thing in the company but if the leader also sits down everybody let's sit down and write it for 10 minutes what we are grateful what a difference it would make in the company and the th uh, fourth one is gratitude has be part of the culture we shouldn't actually practice gratitude one month or because we are in a difficult or uh, situation we pr should practice gratitude and then forget about next next month no we should maintain it throughout the organizational culture if we have this organizational culture develop i would say the employees they would be willing to come into this organization and work when they work what happens it affects the bottom line the profit figure so that's what business is all about increasing the profit but we can increase that profit by upholding and valuing valuing appreciating our employees thank you yes very very good i mean you you shared a lot of different things that you know we came i think being grateful is is always um you know a mindset that if if we carry it also you know personally is helpful and is healthy but also the people around you will know how grateful you are for 
the small things that happens within the environment and i think it multiplies and everybody else learn from you now to all the participants i would like you to go to the chat box and write down what is one thing you are grateful today at this moment of time in your life it could be your family it could be the community that you live in um so take a moment what is one thing you are grateful about yeah what is one thing that you are grateful about go to the chat box and 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 write it down yeah Good, good, good. Keep the uh, keep the points coming. Keep the points coming. Good, 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 good. All right. Now we're going to go to the 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 next question, and it's is for uh, Safia. What wellness solutions that Sisu Global Wellness implemented that had a significant return on investment in your um, context in terms of you know Trinidad and Tobago? So if you could speak about this and give us some indication on that. Certainly, thank you so much for that question, Afi. And Shakina shared a lot of those strategies already, but I want us to. think about Eddie had shared about the future of work the future of work really needs to be included in the culture of wellness as well we need to create a harmonious cycle rather than this vicious cycle of work 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 where we become overly stressed and burnt out we need to find that very delicate work life blend where we feel healthy and balanced where we create a consciousness of energy and focus where employ then feel appreciated where they not only feel appreciated but where they feel supported and as shahina said where their well being is nurtured and valued so with that kind of over concept of creating a wellness culture then organizations can use that mantra to then implement certain strategies so the strategies can be very very simple I should you know share you can just switch in and put a water cooler throughout the organization instead of the hyping sweet drinks and overly processed food putting simple things like water encouraging the use of our hydration letting employees know how important their health is encouraging a breakfast service with only healthy food and healthy snacks Or it could be micro investments, bigger investments, where you can encourage wellness adventures. And Maldives is primed. Singapore is places like that is primed for these type of adventures. We have done it similarly here in Trinidad and Tobago because we have a type of culture and environment where we encourage wellness adventures within all the employees and their families. Once you start to see that involvement of families, then you get to really get that buy-in at both your upper level and your lower level throughout the entire in- company. Another very cool thing we did was incorporated something called like a Zen room, where employees can go and have a retreat. They can take in within their eight to four, whatever hours that they're working, if they feel overwhelmed or stressed. Rather than persist through that overwhelm or stress, just as we did here, we took a break. So they moved towards that Zen room. We just took a break and then we returned very strongly. So I've seen where companies and organizations, and even myself, our organization has moved that forward, where we've implemented a Zen room, a room where you. Uh, Aisha Hina said you can probably have those beautiful gratitude statements on the wall you can get the calming sense what we have done here locally is we've tried to involve a lot of our small businesses that produce candles that produce nice music so we've involved them so there's that integration of creating a consciousness of wellness all around uh, i hope that all the participants here after they leave they feel invigorated to transform their habits i want to leave you i know this is not our closing moment but i want to leave you with a really nice acronym i leave all my organizations with i ask them to think about it they ask me what do what should we do dr mohammed i say think about it t transform each your habits 
I, your intentions. N, negativity. Through kindness, kinetic motions. So anything you want to do about how to implement wellness, think about it. Transform the intentions, the negativity, DH, the habits, the intentions, the negativity, through kindness and kinetic motions. And that's your solution there for implementing wellness. That, that's a great idea. I mean, I, I was trying to write it down, but I couldn't. So that would be great if you could submit. write that on the chat box so that we all can get it. I think uh, I'm sure it will be very helpful, um, you know, in terms of, you know, di different, you know, ideas that you shared. Um, I know Shad, who is on the call, actually wrote about it. Uh, I actually like the idea about the Zen room at the workplace or a mindfulness place or a place where you, I mean, well, I, I, you know, my mindfulness activity is I look at the beach, I look at the water, um, and, you know, the sunset, I could be looking at the sunset or sunrise for, uh, you know, uh, 20, 30 minutes, and I'm just looking at it, and I'm just thinking how, how, you know, amazing it is to be living and breathing and living at this moment of time. And that's one mindful activity that I've, you know, I've shared this before, but something that I do really, really often. Um, to uh, to Leash, um, glo um, to globally, we can see that companies record a wellness officer or a wellness engagement officer. And I think we did touch this a little bit on the previous uh, recap. What is the role of a wellness officer and what should be the qualities of a wellness officer? And what's the role of a uh, uh, you know, wellness of them promoting and aiding corporate wellness. Over to you, Alicia. So before I uh, uh, start answering to my question, I would just like to give like a comment to both the speakers. So first of all, uh, to what Shafia has uh, mentioned about taking a break and taking like small uh, changes actually help your uh, overall well-being. And also to uh, Shaheen about the uh, gratitude, the importance of using gratitude, because we have seen that in COVID situation, many of us were in stress. We had high levels of anxiety, fear, but then when we stop and think about the things that matter to us or the gratitude or the things that we need to be grateful about, it actually helped me personally as well. So we actually had support groups throughout uh, the full lockdown situation to actually just talk to people about their fears and identify what are the things that they are grateful about that actually help people also. Uh, thank you, Shahina, for that. So moving on to uh, my question, we need to know that uh, Employees comes from different places. We know employees are fathers, they are mothers, they are sisters, brothers, daughters. So we need to be mindful about it. What organizations usually do is they categorize or they make policies regarding the average employee. So we need to make policies which are unique, which are actually coming from uh, bottom to top as well. We need to make our policies individualized and unique. So as a result, many organizations, they employ a wellness engagement or a wellness officer. So the main role is actually identifying the gaps. Why aren't the, the employees going to their maximum level? Why can't they achieve their potential level? Because we know that employees spend majority of their day in their work. And, but their work is crucial to them, to their livelihood as well. So they are actually looking for a very motivated, encouraged workplace. So as in, uh, once again, as a wellness engagement officer, what you can do is create that happiness culture, create that compassionate culture. As a person, you have to be a role model. You have to be free of judgment, uh, free of bias, and you should have the genuineness to actually help others, genuineness to identify what is happening in the worker's life and what does the worker need in order to keep an edge or push towards reaching their full potential and uh, full uh, efficiency as well. So it, it could be from uh, having small circle group discussions to uh, arranging individualized therapy for some, some employees who might be in need of it. Uh, respecting values and also agreeing to disagree. So as a wellness engagement officer, you should know that everyone won't agree with you. So you need to make, once again, uh, conversations, compassionate com conversations with the workers instead of uh, jumping into conclusions or setting um, rules and policies without being compassionate about the workers. So. So uh, we need to make, the engagement officer need to make sure that the workplace is an accepting and acknowledged and uh, the workers are driven to work. Because we know that a lot of uh, 
skilled workers, a lot of educated, experienced workers actually quit the organization because of workplace harassment, whether sexual or physical or in terms of emotional harassment. So uh, a lot of organizations, even in Maldives, lose their workers due to uh, unhealthy or toxic work environment. So the role of uh, wellness engagement officers to make sure that the workplace is uh, uh, a safe environment for their workers. So uh, in terms of what our, our role or Institute for Wellness Education, our role is developing awareness session. What's the importance of having a good mental health? What's the importance of having a self-care training? So we train our workers. So we train psychosocial support teams in organizations to create that culture. So they don't need to every time reach to a mental health professional or a specialized person. So inside the organization, creating the a culture of acceptance, the culture of cohesiveness, the culture of uh, non-judgmental, uh, free environment. So what we do is we have packages to uh, promote relaxations, mindfulness, uh, how to self-regulate, how to direct your attention towards healthy thoughts, and also how to make healthy life choices. So uh, our point is like, almost all of the organization we have our chief executive officers we have managing directors so why can't we employ you why can't we give the task of a, a chief wellness or a chief well-being officer in our organization yes that's 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 very good um to all the participants i have a question within your organization uh, if you're a, if you work for an organization how many of you have a wellness officer in your organization or how many of you have a person or a section or a couple of people is in charge for the wellness of the people or health and safety go to the chat box and write your response there how many of you have uh, such a yeah well see some of you wrote okay some of you wrote that you have a wellness committee oh good i can i know what you mean <laughs> good 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 yeah all right, okay. Hosham is one of our team members. So he mentioned that uh, we have an wellness committee. That's very good. We have an wellness committee. Yes, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think this is a very important. And like I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly advocating for it um, that you don't really have to hire somebody as the, you know, if you're in your department or even create a committee, right? Create a little committee whereby you take somebody from each department and that can always help. And again, this is something you have to do voluntarily. So ask for people who voluntarily wants to do it. And I'm sure you never know when you ask how many of them will say yes. So it is a very important key area. Over to you, Shahina, on this uh, question. Um, I mean, I know you practice coaching and, and you know, as a health coach um, in terms of you know, wellness and health, and you share a lot of health and reference specifically about you know, the mental well-being um, you know, at, at workplace. Um, as a professional coach, why do you believe it is important to have employee well-being as a business growth strategy? And how important is to invest in employee well-being as a restructure of organization post-pandemic? I suppose Lee talk a lot about the wellness office and obviously for some organization that may require change in their strategy, absorbent investment. So if you could speak about how can organizations do this as a holistic approach? All right, China, I think I actually made you mute, but you can speak now. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Afif. That is actually a wonderful question because we are talking about uh, happiness, well-being of the employees. So why do we need to have a uh, well-being as a growth strategy? When we actually employ, when we look at employee well-being, it is not about smiling faces friendly gestures or cracking jokes. It is also not about having a coffee uh, coffee pot in the kitchen or the walls painted, but well-being is about need to know one matters, that the employee has an impact in the bigger picture, on the bottom line, need, looking at the positives in a negative situation, working in an environment where people are connected in more meaningful ways, placing more value on individual learning and development. So 
when we look at these components actually it is very important to have it as a growth strategy because business we always most of the time we think about the profit the profit how are we going to increase the sales the customer satisfaction but with the customer satisfaction with the profit we have to take care of one of the components one of the main assets of our organization our employees actually we have a very good example in maldives villa college villa college have a staff club and during this pandemic actually at the beginning since the beginning of this year they have through this staff club they are practicing doing very lot of collaborative activities having quizzes competitions and uh, uh, best loser competition where they actually promote physical uh, so they go to gym the uh, employees usually what happen is as a villa college it's the huge organization with lot of responsibilities so the employees with teaching with marking with uh, supervision the lecturers the staff support staff everybody is so busy but because of this pr- project everybody takes the time to go to the gym because the club is rewarding them for their effort and then also they report after the uh, gym time they feel more happier they feel satisfied in their work so that's a very good example from our society so with setting that so the company creates higher level of engagement collaboration allowing a more agile and resilient organization to emerge this creates enhanced efficiency and creativity thus greater profits so when we have this strategy in workplace actually we are increasing the profits we are adding value to our customer customers so why do we actually have, should have this growth strategy during this covid pandemic why is it important what happened during pandemic everybody was put off balance we are actually shook to our core people who are earning 5000 6000 dollars were just sent home without any pay so what would happen they would be shocked with the feed their family they don't know how to support their family so people are in a terrible situation and as we recover and come into the new normal what happens these employees actually when they come back they can't trust the organization because the next time this happens will this company be sending us off again without pay how can i make my life better they would be thinking about it. today in our opening remark mr ron kaufman said when we actually serve we provide the service with care and love that's why we need the growth, uh, well well being strategy as our actually growth strategy if we have this we could be we would should be including our employees as part, our um, assets so i think with the growth strategy as a business growth strategy as one of the key components companies would do much better in the longer term we should have them and also the thing i would highlight is the company already because of this covid situation they are in a trouble so they have to actually think about ways on how they can grow the business divert the business diversify so if we can actually they can allocate keep this part out and as professional coaches we are available in the market so if they can actually leave that part to professionals and then they focus on the business concept actually we could do a much better job in the long term thank you yes very good uh, i mean the key point there is you know in organizations we have to drive this strategy i mean it is linked to the business because if people are well their performance is going to be great they will meet your expectations and then they will also serve the you know your clients your customers your guests in a re- regardless of the type of the business that you are in it because it's all linked together and i think this pandemic has has shown us not just this i think it, you know at times you know when there is a health and safety issue in the company we talk about it and then we forget but what we should really do is we should take actions on 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 at, at, at various levels um you know we have come to the end of our our conversation today uh, so i would like to uh, this evening and i would like to um you know go back to the participants and see um you know if you have any questions or comments oh take take the chat box what is one key point that you have learned from our three special speakers before they do their closing remark um uh, or closing thought so go to the chat box and write uh, your key takeaway from the three speakers as you see the uh, safia spoke about the 
globe, we you know, well from a global context, and uh, Liz spoke about the local context, and but this is a really important part of what we need to focus on, what we need to do. Um, uh, and and China spoke about happiness and gratitude at workplace. So let's take a moment um, and write down your comments and your learning from this panel discussion on wellness and happiness at workplace. which is a key important factor in bringing and cultivating a culture of learning so let's take a moment with that yeah good so there is a question there for shahid thank you shahid for the question um how uh, how would we get over the different levels of intellectuality in your own organization when it comes to creating more awareness on tonight's subject I suppose the question is: This is a very important thing, but how do you actually, you know, get this to different levels? Because different people think in different ways. We see this as an important thing, but some may not see this as an important thing, right? I think it's the same thing like smoking. We all know it's dangerous for health, but some just just do it because temper, you know, for the moment you may not see an, uh, you know, negative impact in your health, but. Well, at a certain stage, when you see it, it may already be late. Um, who would like to take on this question? Um, I'll start. I, I have no problem with starting with that. Oh, How about? Yeah. Um, it's uh, initially here in Trinidad and Tobago, wellness, well-being was taught as a very nebulous type, airy fairy concept, and the focus on the has always been on the bottom line the productivity productivity but the minute you can tie in the return on investment or the loss to the the economy of the company the minute you can tie in what an unwell employee or what that brings to the company then you you do get that buy in for the wellness programs i've learned how to show high level decision makers what is the return on their investment for a wellness uh, strategy and one of the things i shared into the chat is that we actually created a wellness toolkit that they didn't even need much involvement from external support that they could utilize their own employees utilizing this toolkit and implement these strategies on a very cost effective at the end of the day all organizations are concerned about bottom line dollars so when you can show them that balance between the investment and the return or the value of the investment then they get it they also get it unfortunately when they have case studies we've had unfortunately a very high level of non communicable diseases here in Chennai which meaning high um employees are sorry, high level persons unfortunately falling to strokes and heart attacks and when they reach the peak of their career then they're not e- no longer effective and had they taken simple measures of managing their stress simple measures of managing burnout then they realize that this would have not befall them so when you can point out some of these case studies and show what the return or the value of investment is then they certainly get more attracted towards it yeah. thank you very much adding um, adding on yes please go ahead yes go ahead yeah adding adding on to that when i spoke with hr professionals from different organization one of the most uh, main challenge that they have identified is workers from different vast majority so there are diverse workforce uh, especially in organizations such, such as uh, sto they have laborers they have pharmacies they have uh, workers working in their shifts so it's kind of like a very diverse workforce so that's one of the main challenging issue that they have raised in how to cater to all of them and how to develop programs where they could actually reach out to all of the diverse work group so the question is very understandable so my suggestion is uh, bring out uh, champions or bring out people from those groups or representatives from different groups when they are doing training for trainers or when they are doing a various program because it's easy to understand if it's coming from someone from you within you it's within your group people or within your expertise if someone is coming you coming to you and explaining it to you it's easier for you to understand yeah 
Very good. Thank you. Um, as we come to our uh, end of our panel discussion this evening on the topic of wellness, happiness, and gratitude at workplace, I would like us each speaker to make a closing remark. So I'm going to start with Shahida. Uh, thank you, Afif. It was actually a very wonderful uh, session. I loved the participation from the group of people, participants. Actually, they were continuously supporting us and, and uh, helping us even perform better. Uh, speak better so i think that's the best thing i got from the, and the incidents we had with uh, uh, hacking i think there's the great learning we move on whatever the challenges are we move on we have this smile we are grateful and we go on thank you thank you as uh, as, as we are coming to the end of our uh, session you know all the participants you are there you know uh, prefer to share some love and care for all our speakers I think they've done a wonderful job this evening. Um, thank you. And a uh, closing remark from uh, Safia. I want to echo what Shahina said. Um, I have the chat up along with the screen, and I'm reading all of the participants' uh, responses. So thank you to each one of the participants who rallied through with us in this. This was the first time I've experienced that Zoom bombing, and it was indeed a little more wrecking, but we learned from it. We learn from each other. So thank you to the participants. And my closing remarks, of course, I'm incredibly grateful to Afif, to the Maldives Association for Human Resource Professionals, to my other co-speakers here with me that facilitated such a great panel discussion. Um, I want to end with, I want us to create, I want us to think about and unleash within us that human creativity, that innovation. I, while we are moving in a technologically advanced world, there are certain traits, unique human traits that cannot be replicated. And those human traits is our intuition, our creativity, our ability to collaborate, our ability to self-respect, and our altruistic measures which is all in it within us. If we think about those unique human traits, we can understand why it is so important to invest in on the most important part of the economy, our human capital. So as we move forward to creating this future of work, whatever COVID has now, this new reality or this new normal, we need to understand that this future of work needs to be a wisdom economy, one of value, one of adding of the people, which is the health of the people. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Sophia. Um, closing remark from Leish. Uh, thank you so much, Afif, Mark, and my fellow speakers. Uh, with the incident which happened, actually, it was a bit nerve-wracking, but uh, having the backing of uh, the participants and the other speakers, it, was a quite an adventure and experience I think for all of us. Uh, before we, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I finish. I would like to say that we are employing human beings, so it's not just a means to an end. So they have their emotional needs, they have their financial needs, they have their spiritual needs. So make sure that you take care of your employees. You uh, are always cautious about the well-being of your employees in order to actually have a successful business and also to have a successful life. So. Thank you so much for this opportunity and I hope local organizations will follow organizations, uh, global organizations such as Safiya and uh, make an example of those organizations and make sure that you take care of your employees both physically and mentally.